Okay, we are live for Inside the Junior Rain, episode number 17. Again, uh, I'm just going to make sure we're showing properly here because every once in a while we... Uh, looks like we're good. Okay, so uh, again, uh, my name is Ben Frank. I'm the president of the Junior Rain. With me here, as always, is Paul Esdale, our Chief of Hockey Operations. And this is our weekly show, Mondays at 2 o'clock. Normally, today was Tuesday. I'll explain where I, why I couldn't do it yesterday in a moment. Um, uh, every week where we give you an inside look on what goes into behind the scenes of our mission of making youth hockey a life-changing experience uh, and involving all those involved to help do that, players, parents, coaches, officials, and the community at large. Um, as always, whether you're watching live or via the replay, a lot of our viewers are, are via replay, please give us a comment, a like, a uh, thumbs up, let us know that you're watching. We love interacting and the questions we get throughout the show, I'll try to be looking at those. Uh, if, in case we get comments throughout the show, we can answer questions really here live. If not, if you're watching the replay, again, feel free to give us our con comments and shares, and uh, we'll get back and answer your questions in between shows or on the next show live. So uh, thanks again um, for joining us. I, uh, today's show, the topic is what it means to be a, a USA Hockey ADM Model Association, American Development Models, what the ADM stands for. We've, we've talked about this uh, you know, a lot, but I think it's still something that's really important to come back to. Um, and uh, we're gonna get into some of the just uh, the details of it today so people can understand a little bit better what it means to actually make that commitment uh, because there's a lot of things that people can do, maybe pieces of the ADM you might see or maybe people think that when 8U is played cross ice, that's an ADM concept, but it's really not what the whole program is. So really get into some details of what it really means to make a full commitment to ADM programming. Um, and also, uh, I just got back, the reason we missed the show yesterday, I actually had the opportunity to present at the US Lacrosse Coaches and Fan Summit, which was awesome. And what I presented on there was our story in becoming a USA Hockey Model Association and how we did that. And I presented to lacrosse clubs because the ABM has now been taken on by the US Olympic Committee at large by all the sports because it's what's best for athlete development in any, in any sport, which is overall athlete development for the long term. It's been adopted by all the sports and US Lacrosse is launching their ADM model club program. And so I went to speak to a cohort group of clubs that are very passionate about doing a great job in athlete development to talk to about how we made some of the changes because there's some pretty radical changes you have to make um, so there's some structural and logistical things and, and personnel-wise and things that you have to change to be able to, to make that come in. And I talked to them about our story and how we were able to do that. So that's why I apologize. I missed the show yesterday. I was on a plane coming back from Baltimore. Had a lot of fun at the U.S. Lacrosse. They call it LaxCon, which is a big uh, conference. And we're back Tuesday today at 2 o'clock. And we'll be back next week, Monday, back to our regular time going forward. So, Paul, I just... Rambled on for a little bit there. Anything to add before we kind of dive into the model club talk? No, I think it just shows the power of what USA Hockey has done and created the American Development Model and now how it's spreading uh, all across the youth sports. And it's really, what it is really is age-appropriate programming based off of sports science. Like if you, if you know what, if, if you don't know anything, if you just know that, that it's yeah. age-appropriate based off of sports science uh, and it gives every kid in the sport the chance to succeed. And that's really the mission of it. And obviously there's a lot of details that go into a lot of changes that we had to make years ago. And it just shows you that this is being recognized, USA Hockey is being recognized, and now USA, US Olympic Committee picking it up. And now we're gonna see USA Lacrosse, obviously we're gonna see USA Football, USA Soccer, all USA these other swimming, sports. Swimming, USA Basketball, right? Yeah, so it's all really the betterment for the athlete. It's, it's athlete-centered, and that's really important. It's not about the coaches, right? It's about the athlete and doing what's best for the athlete at the right time. So there's three things I want to kind of get into today, uh, Paul, is that I want to talk about, again, why, why the, where did the ADM come from and how, why did it get established and how did it get established in the first place. Um, I want to talk about when we made the decision to become an ADM model club and why and how. And uh, this is uh, you know, ambitious to get through all this, so hopefully we'll get through it all today. And I want to go through in detail you know, what the actual application is if a club, because any club, any club can can technically become an ADM model club, but it's not easy to yeah. do so. You have to meet a lot of requirements. And you have to be able to do a lot of things from a club standpoint to be able to deliver on that. And you have to have the confidence of the USA Hockey National staff that you can deliver world-leading age-appropriate programming at every level based on these recommendations. So I wanna actually go through some of the 
requirements because we have to make major changes in our club to be able to do this. It's a big commitment and it's a, you have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to lose people. You have to be willing to make some hard stances on things. Um, and so I want to go through some of those details as well at the end. So first, let's start with um, let's start with what it, like where did the ABM come from? Because I think it's important to know who's funding it, yep. why it got why it was necessary to put in existence in the first place, and why it's so important. Yeah. So years ago, I think it was back in two thousand nine. If you can correct me on that date, but uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, National Hockey League were getting together and. USA Hockey realized at the highest levels, you know, the, the, the people they're trying to put in the Olympic Games was they were they were having players at that level lacking a lot of skills. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the model and said, well, what? We're such a big country. We have all these people playing hockey. Why can't we produce the same amount of players for, for the ratio of smaller countries like Sweden and Finland, right? So that USA Hockey looked at that. Uh, the US like Olympic Committee, they looked at that and they realized it wasn't the top end that was broken. They realized that the bottom levels, the grassroots of the game and how we were developing our kids was broken. Yeah. So they spent years and years of studying based off sports science and obviously had a lot of input from a lot of different people and they came up with what is called the American Development Model. And basically, like I said at the start, right, it, it's focused on doing the right things for the, for the kids at the right ages, right? So age appropriate. And they realized like, when kid, there's what we call is the windows of trainability, and if you if you don't know anything, know that yeah. right. These are critical, right? So there's different stages at different age groups that the kids are open to develop more, right? Their physical co and cognitive capacities are open. Their energy systems, to specific right? Specific things. Specific right? things. So at 14, it's different than eight, right? But but when you're if you're not a model club, you're not doing ADM programming. You're sometimes you're doing. 14 year old practices for eight year olds. And what happens is they miss out on those critical windows and then they never reach their full potential. The goal of this is for one, to have kids in the game who love the game and what they have to, we want them to love the game so they stay in the game and then for them to reach their fullest genetic potential, whatever that may be. And that's gonna be different for everyone. But we know for doing the wrong things, yeah. they have no chance to reach their genetic potential. So that's why the ADM was created. It's funded by the National Hockey League, right? Eight to nine million dollars a year come from the National Hockey League to USA Hockey to develop the programming and, and educate people around the country about it. And, and I think the next question people say is, well, why is there only 21 model clubs? Mm -hmm. And we can get in that. And it's because the youth sports model, youth hockey model is broken in my opinion. And it's really hard to become a model club. Right? There's so many changes. There's a lot of politics that some organizations have to go through and it's really hard for them to make these changes. And, right, and, and years ago, we, we, took, we took a step back and realized that for us, to continue, for us to continue on and do the right things to the kids, we knew we had to make massive changes, right? And then we really kind of stumbled upon the ADM, right? And our relationship with USA Hockey, uh, my college coach, Roger Grillo, uh, is one of the regional managers of the ADM. And it all kind of connected. We had some other connections there and we stumbled upon it and we realized that we, we, we studied and looked at it and said, hey, this is something that's really important. We all play the game at a high level. This all makes sense, right? And I think that's what the USA hockey guys see when they're going around the country is the people that played at the highest levels, the college guys, um, they get the ADM, mm -hmm. right? They understand it. And it's, it's the challenges, the education at the grassroots levels to the new hockey families. And I think um, that's a constant daily um, education programming that we do every day. Well, anything with m massive change with, with millions of people potentially, right? <laughs> it takes time, but just to expand on that a little sure. bit, Paul, when it happens, so Ken Martell, who's the technical director of the ADM for USA Hockey, and you, those in our club have seen him around. He's been to our club for a number yeah. of visits. He, he's Southern California is also his territory to oversee. He, you know, he played college hockey, won a national championship, coached college hockey, coached on, on the, coaches for the US national teams in various, various levels. Um, you know, has getting his PhD in sports science and one of the most knowledgeable sits on the US Olympic Committee yeah. One of the most knowledgeable people in the world on athlete development and hockey development specifically He was working at the US national team development program working with the highest level 
athletes in the country and for USA hockey, the kids that the players that are going to go on to play for Team USA at the Olympics and the World Championships and these things, and they were frustrated yeah. because, yeah, like you said, at the top levels, it's not broken. They're they're getting great coaching and great training and great you know strength coaches and skills coaches and systems coaches and all these things at the highest levels, but they could only do so much with them. And they're looking at countries like Sweden, Finland, Czech Republic, who have fifty thousand players. Oh my goodness, we lost lights. Oh, okay, well, we're going to keep going here in the, in the, in the, in the dark uh, because I think, uh, all right, well, this is just, it's just a curveball. This is, going to test, this is going to test our, let's see how it looks. This is going to test our abilities here. Oh, they're back. Okay, okay so um, they were realizing that no matter how much they gave these players, they have, U.S. High Hockey has, has almost 400,000 players. I think it's 360-something thousand. And these other countries have 50, 60, 70,000 players. How are they beating us at the World Championships? How is this even possible? It shouldn't be mathematically possible. We're right. going to keep going here without getting sure. faced. Um, so they're like, no matter what they were doing with them at the highest levels, they weren't able to catch, they didn't have enough time, they were running out of time to catch up because of all the things that were being missed at the younger levels. And through, this, through the research and through the study of the science and, and also from going to these other countries, going to Sweden, going to Finland, going to Czech Republic, seeing what are these places doing? How are they, how are they beating us with such a lesser pool of players? And they, see, they, they saw that programming and they combined it with the research and they came out with the ADM model so that by the time, so a number, a number of things, right? So that more players would stay in the sport longer, which would give us even more players at the highest level to choose, for, to choose from for the highest levels. And also so that players were, using their windows of trainability and developing to their full potential so by the time they got to those highest levels, they were, were having to go back and work on basic skill sets and movement patterns that they should have been developed over the last 10 years and they're able to take them to the next level. We're, a little dark. we're really dark here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we well, can... Check uh, the lights for a sec. <laughs> wonder if we can adjust this. I should play some Jeopardy music or something here while we, while we wait here. Maybe if you open the... or if we switch the camera around. What if we flip the angle? Sure. I wonder, if we, if we don't go to, I wonder if we don't go to the... Let's sit there for a second and see what... Sorry, everyone. We're going to keep going here. <laughs> this is what happens when you do live TV. Let's see if this is any better. better. Let me close, close that door. Can you see better here? It's a little bit better because there's okay. less uh, light. Okay. 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 All right, we're guys. We're keep. We're going. We're still going. So, so yeah, Ben. A couple. Po I'm going to sit down yeah. here. See if it's other. So, a couple points, and I think that's, uh, and that that's. It really started with the highest level of hockey, right? And then they brought it down. And I think some of the points with the ADM, and sometimes people may not know or, uh, or forget, it's not just, for example, one of the concepts of playing cross ice hockey, right? Yeah. So it's really focused on the windows of trainability. And one of those concepts is playing small area hockey for the younger age groups, right? Watch my skates there. Uh, but the other, some of the other important things is having an off-ice program, right? So developing athletes, right? There's another, another important one is the roster sizes. Mm -hmm. So how, how big the roster sizes are on teams, right? Other, other important things, obviously how you practice, but how you follow the work to rest ratios, right? Mm -hmm. So at an eight U level, if, if kids are standing in line and going every third or fourth time, they're obviously not being active enough, right? And that, that age, they want to be more active, right? So it's important. There's all these little details of, 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 um, of an ADM programming that's important. So I want to go into those, I want to go into those details too, Paul. We're a little bit better. We're, we're still <laughs> kind of dark. Hopefully we'll get the lights on in a minute. But um, just, just to get back to, you mentioned, you mentioned that the NHL funds the ADM program. So I want to go back. So when, when, they did, when, when USA Hockey, Ken was a huge part of this, could clearly show that, look, our players are behind because of our grassroots programming and education uh, worldwide. There's, there's only so much we can do at the, ho the highest level. This is the program that we want to be able to, to launch. This is the benefits that it's going to offer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep more kids involved in the sport. It's going to be more fun. It's going to develop their skills better. And, and so what, but why would, think about it, right? The, the NHL is a business, right? And the, the, all the teams are, are businesses. Why would they pay eight, nine million dollars a year to make this program happen, because USA Hockey wasn't just going to raise membership fees and all this stuff to make to, sure. to pay for the staff that go around to different parts of the country, and we got hard boards, we got different resources and sure. research and all these things. Why would the NHL pay for that? To, well, and a couple points on my side would be one, 
they saw that the youth hockey model was broken, right? And they saw that there was kids quitting hockey. You know, I think that the stat was 60% at the peewee age level. Mm -hmm. So they said all these kids leaving the game, they know that those kids are potential fans, right? So they knew growing the game is so important for hockey, right? They're up against, and especially in the US, they're up against, you know, football, they're up against basketball, they're up against these major sports. And they knew that growing the game is critical, right? So I think if, if, if you don't do, if you don't develop kids the right way and they're quitting because there's too much pressure, it's no fun, uh, they're, they're not very good hockey players. If you're not players. getting better, it's not as not fun. Getting better, too, right? It's not as fun, right? Yeah. So that, they realize that, hey, if we want to grow this game, not just at the you know, eight and under level, but all at the national hockey level and grow our fan base, that we got to get, the, we got to partner with USA Hockey on this programming. And once they did that, and that's why they fund it, right? Because they want to grow the game. And also on USA Hockey side, this is so important to them because they want to win gold medals at the highest level, mm -hmm. right? They want to win world junior championships. They want their kids when they're at the right age to be ready to compete at the highest levels, right? So the ADM is not just for mites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's then that's one of the biggest misconceptions, right? I even I hear people call my, the mite age group or eight and under ADM. Like then I hear people around around the country just call that. That's ADM, and that's completely wrong, mm -hmm. right? It's an ADM eight and under. There's an ADM. Con, you know, there's a concept of playing cross ice hockey. People don't hockey. realize that it started with trying to figure out the highest level of players. What's how do we get the more higher level highest level players? Like that's where it started from. We're at the national team development program, and we need better players what's going on here why why do we not why are we running out of time with them and just to your point about what the nhl wanted to nhl fans and attendance goes up when usa hockey when usa hockey wins olympic gold medals when they're in gold medal games when they're in gold medal world cup games and things people get excited about it. people feel proud in the u.s about it people become hockey fans more people want to play and also if the anaheim ducks have a kid from Southern California on their team, or uh, USA USA born players on their teams. Again, for fans and for people getting an interested in the sport, it's great marketing and great tools for them too. So they want to develop more players at the highest levels, and they know because they, when they look at the research and they look at uh, the data, they know that the ADM program will develop players better all the way up from eight U, six U, all the way up to the highest levels of players, and keep more kids involved in the game. That's going to help the game in, in, in the United States. And that's going to help their businesses too. So people, I think, like you said, a lot of people think it's it's just the eight U level going cross ice because that was like the biggest shock change when the ADM launched. And we'll even tell you, USA Hockey will tell you that maybe they made a mistake kind of starting there because people associate, oh, it's just for the eight U levels. That's just a that's that happens to be what the windows of trainability say at the eight U level is important to that age group. That's like through two percent of the whole ADM program. Yeah, and and one of the other big pieces. Uh, when we made the changeover was 12 and under, 10 and under, 8 and under, equal playing time in games, mm -hmm. right? And, and that may sound easy to do, but when, you know, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people are focused on that, that result of the game and you're playing everyone equally, so you're going to lose some, you may lose some games because of that, mm -hmm. right? And, and the philosophy behind that is it's not just to be nice, right? Is we, we, nobody knows at those younger ages who's gonna be the best player down the road in four, five, six years, right? So if we don't play everyone, it, first one, it, it's not fair, one, right? And two, we're doing an injustice to the sport because that kid at 11 years old that was one of the weakest players, but we didn't play him, he may have quitting and he could have been the best player of all those players, but we never know. And that's, that's, that's the science speaking, right? Of hockey is a late specialization sport, right? So it's really important that we practice the right way on, off the ice, and we, we have the right roster sizes, and we play the kids the right way during the games, they right? They have a chance to become their best players they can be. And as they grow older, there, there's, some, there's some different requirements, right? But at the older ages, ADM programming is critical, mm -hmm. right? I'd almost, it may be even more critical, right? I think every age group has their different, uh, different programming of the ADM, and it's all critical that they follow the windows of trainability. Because as we know, if you don't follow those windows of trainability, they won't reach their potential. The ADM is all about reaching their potential and becoming the best player they can be. And you know what? If 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 they're 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, they still have a long way to go. The, the average NHL player, 26 years old, right? First year in the NHL. College players, now 20, 21 years old, the first time in college. So if you're 14 and now you're starting to do all... You know, not developing your your skill sets and not developing your physical capacities, and maybe focus more just on 
uh, winning hockey games as a t team play and positional stuff and playing safe and doing these types of things. You're you got five, six, seven, eight years of development still. It's like you said, it's maybe even more critical for those kids that are really motivated that age group to be following ADM programming. It doesn't. It's not going to look like the eight eight U ADM looks like. Yeah. It's not going to look like the twelve U ADM looks like. It's going to look different at each level if you if you know what you're yeah. doing. And the other big point that and that we didn't necessarily say exactly is the. LTAD. Yeah. Right. That's we the, that's we, we talked about AU to 18 year. What we really mean is the research is LTAD standing for long term athletic development. Right. And that's the programming is based off of that. Right. So you can't, what they say, speed farm. Right. You mm -hmm. can't rush it. So it's going to take time for kids to reach their full potential. Right. And if you rush the process, you're going to get an unfinished product. Yeah. Right. So you have to take your time. Make sure you go through the right steps and the right years and hit the right windows. And then, once competition really matters at the 18, 19, 20 year old age group, right? Mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're trying to win at the highest levels, then we want a product that's it's nearly ready to compete at that level. And guys, Google LTAD. I mean, this is not even totally new stuff. This mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is world accepted, all sport, you know, Canada, Europe, Asia, wherever you want to, with other sports. You, you, the development models, LTAD, long-term athletic development programming, is widely accepted by the scientific community as this is how Olympic programs mm -hmm. that are funded by governments and things develop their athletes to try to win gold medals. This is really what athlete development is. Yeah, I'd love to speak speak on Canada for a little bit because we're both from Canada originally, sure. grew up there, um, and and you're now just seeing Hockey Canada adopt some of these principles, mm -hmm. right? They're adopting this. They're a couple of years behind USA Hockey, but just the last couple of years. Now they're adopting some of these, and now they're, they're having a hard time implementing them because the culture of hockey in Canada is so ingrained, right? Mm -hmm. And I grew up there, and I, I didn't play college hockey and professional hockey because of my coaching and my practices, yeah. right? Not even close. I was able to do that because we had the outdoor rink. Mm -hmm. So I was able to play four, six, seven hours you know, a week or a day with playing the game of hockey, right? So there was no coaches, there was no parents, there was no referees. It was just kids and the love of the game. And that's why so many people in Canada are able to succeed is because they have that out outdoor rink and states like Minnesota, Michigan, and at the end of the day, you know, states like California, we don't have that, right? So that's why it's so critical for us to take advantage of every second on the ice. And that's why the ADM program is so good because it follows the activity ratios. It's based off sports of science and it takes advantage of every 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 inch of the ice and every every second of the ice. So I want to talk about and, and we may have to continue in the next show as well. I want to talk about our, our journey and kind of why we become a model club. Sure. And and I just I'm gonna summarize. I just told this story at U.S. Lacrosse Summit. Um, you know, years ago in, in in 2011, shortly after I took over the Wildcats Hockey Club at the time as a president. And Paul, you were our first um, you know major hire. Shortly you know shortly after that after I took over there. I actually got, I got invited to the ADM Symposium. This is 2011 when they were launching the ADM programming for all the clubs. Uh, I mean, not really for all the clubs, they were just launching the, the material, the educational material. And I got a chance to go, it was it really kind of was a fluke. I'd helped out with some things. They needed representatives from different areas. I had, I had volunteered for some stuff and, and I ended up getting a chance to go and sit in this symposium for five days in a row and they had, because they were just launching it, they had experts from Sweden and Finland and Russia and had NHL general managers and NHL coaches and college coaches and all these things. And I, I spent an entire week almost listening to all the research and, 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 and sports science on athlete development. And before this, I had just, I had my mind, I, I wasn't aware of this. And I played college hockey and junior A hockey and things, but I was just doing, I was coaching a 10 and under and 12 and under team. And I was just doing the drills that I did in college with these kids. And I mean, I, mean, I cared about the kids and I worked hard and I was organized. But I remember being in that uh, symposium and first I was really pumped up and excited because there's all this just amazing research and information from these world experts. I got a chance to listen to them and ask them questions on the coffee breaks and things like that. And then I was just horrified <laughs> because I realized what I was doing. I thought like I knew hockey, I played hockey at a good level and I've been coaching for a long time and things like that. But what I was doing was, was wrong. And it wasn't what's best for the kids' long-term potential. And for me, I did care. I did care about the kids. So that was hurtful. And this was mid-season. So I was. I had to make this decision. Do I go back and I keep doing what I'm doing, even though I know it's wrong? I know it's gonna. It, it's potentially limiting their potential. And I do. I want to be someone who have an adverse effect on these kids, or do I want to be someone that's having a positive effect? 
So I ended up having some soul-searching moments, and I came back, and we talked about it, yeah. and I changed everything in the middle of the season. That wasn't easy. People got mad because they didn't understand it, and I didn't really maybe know how to communicate it as well and all these things, but I massively changed everything. The kids had a ton more fun. I had more fun, and started trying to figure it out, and then we worked together over the next year with USA Hockey staff because we said once we dove into it, we're like, yeah. this, we have to do this. We can't, once we know, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you know, we can't just willingly... Even if you're, even if you start doing your teams, you coach, and I start doing my teams, I coach. We're leaders in this in this club, and we can't just willingly know this stuff and know what's right for the kids and know what's the best for them, and then just oh, it's too hard, or this guy won't change, or those people might not understand, and just not do it. It's just it just wasn't. We weren't going to do that, so we had to make those massive changes. So it took us a couple of years, and we had to get a lot of new staff, and a lot of stuff had to leave, and some people who maybe didn't want to, you know, we had to like I said, change a lot of guidelines to requirements and some people didn't want to do that. And that was okay. We had to be willing to stand up for that. And that's what a lot of people in clubs, unfortunately, they, you know, they don't want to lose people. They don't have coaches that they can replace their coaches with. And they don't maybe have enough kids that they lose some kids from a team and they're not willing to make that change. Yeah. And when I, when I, uh, great points, Ben, it's, it's been a journey and it's, it's still a journey, right? And, I, and when I talk to people at the ABM is, you know, it's supported by the National Hockey League and the U.S. Olympic Committee. What is the alternative if you aren't in an ADM program? Yeah. Right. And I don't. I, there's so what I would say is there's two really models, right? There's the development model, which is the American development model, mm -hmm. and then there's what maybe we call as the competition or win at all cost model. Yeah. Right. And really, that that's not even a model though. So, you know, you can have a ten under team and play your five best players and try to win games and mm -hmm. may win them and run them like a college team. But where and what? That's not any kind of program. Yeah. Like, there's no program there. So to me, when I found out with the ADM, when we we talked about down in 2011, it was a complete no-brainer because we knew it's the best thing for the kids. And yeah, we know it's hard, and we know that it's it's not maybe your typical program around some of the rinks you see right now because it's newer and it's hard to implement. And I think that's the challenge, right? It's very hard to implement because you do have to make a lot of changes. But knowing what we knew and know, finding out about the ADM, it, it was really, an, for us, an easy change personally to make sure we did the right things for the kids all the time. And from a programming perspective, I mean, it, it, there's no excuses, right? You're either, you're either implementing a player development first program, yep. in which case you do everything you can to understand the science and deliver that program at every level, no matter what, B team, A team, triple A mm -hmm. team, 8U team, 14U team, you either do it or you don't. Yeah. If you don't, then you either, you're not, you're, you're, you're not willing to make those changes or you're just trying to win hockey games, which, yeah. you know, that's, that's what you're doing. And that's, I guess what you're doing. And the point, point is you can't have both. Yeah. Right. So you can't be one foot in one foot out kind of thing. Right. So does the ADM programming want kids to reach the potential and win hockey games? Of course. And do we want our kids to have success and win hockey games? Of course. Right, but we can't sacrifice kids' development just to win one game on that weekend, right? We have to look at the whole picture of their athletic career, their LTAD, long-term athletic development. So if you look at it, right, and you spread it out over a timeline, say a kid starts at five years old and his youth hockey goes to 18 years old, if you take some shortcuts and sacrifices when he's seven, he's not gonna make it to 18, right? So we wanna make sure Every step of the way, we're doing the right things. And that's why for us, uh, learning about the ADM and, and understanding you know, that the NHL, U.S. Olympic Committee was behind it and, and educating people on it, for us, it was, it was exciting and still exciting today. And that's why we spend time today talking about it. I think that's time we'll spend more talking and about one it. And one of the things that helps uh, people when I, when I go in and speak to other clubs, because I've gone around for UC Hockey and spoken about our journey too, becoming a model club, and the changes we've made. One of the things that helps them kind of understand tangible differences, right? We measured this. We didn't just do this and then just, you know, hope it was better. We actually measured it too, right? So there's a few things here. I just want to wrap up with this. Sure. So when we were, when we were, before we were a model club, we were the standard kind of thing to do was all the teams had two practices a week, yep. right? And a lot of times it was full sheet. Some, some of the age groups might've been shared, but you have two practices a week uh, and that's it. Um, so that was so that was one thing that we had to make a major change because ADM guidelines are three to one practice the game ratio at ten and under up. So we needed three practices. Oh, but also every team needed off ice training for part of their development yeah. too. Not just the AAA midget AAA team. Every team needed and needs the age, age appropriate athletic development, a, a physical literacy development 
off the ice as well. So we need to add that in too. So just, just from pure figuring out the, 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 what our program gave each week, we had to figure it out in a way that didn't raise our dues and things like that. So sharing practices and things like that. We went from two hours a week of on ice practice to three hours a week of on ice practice, plus two hours a week, sometimes more when we do the three days of off ice training. So we went to five, five to two, right? So over, 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 over the course of this, over the course of the season, it was two and a half times the amount of actual development time the players had and training for the season. Just that one change already is two and a half seasons to one as far as time, time training. Okay, just in those changes of hours. So if, if for a kid that stays in our program for the life of their youth hockey career, six U to sixteen U, eight U to eighteen U. Okay, that's 15 additional seasons of development just for making that one scheduling change. Just sharing ice better, planning it out more, having an off ice component as part of it. So 15 additional seasons of development, how much of a difference is that gonna make for a kid? <laughs> just making some changes. That's not even increasing costs or anything, that's just making scheduling changes to organize this out to follow the guidelines. Okay, 15 additional seasons over, over a kid's career. Okay, so what else do we do though? We use the activity tracker, right? And we've, so, so the activity tracker, and Paul, you use this all the time, we get parents involved, right? We watch a kid on the ice during practice and track how long they spend skating, how much time they have a puck on their stick, how many shots they take, how many passes they make, how much coaches feedback they get. Okay, and we track, Paul actually tracked an old school pro coach, high level coaches, you know, considered professional coaches, full time youth hockey coach practices, and he tracked our new practices following the ADM guidelines at the, at the youth levels. Okay, the difference was 10 times the amount of skating, 10 times the amount of passing, I think it was seven times the amount of shots, uh, seven times or 10 times the amount of coaches feedback. It was all like 10 and seven. And what I did when I, when I did this presentation at the clubs, I took an average of five times. So I gave, like, let's say that old school practice was at the, the, at the best day and ours was on its worst day. It was still five times the amount of activity. Okay, when you multiply five times the amount of activity each session and two and a half times the, the volume, it's 12 and a half seasons of development to one season of what we were doing. Because I know we know this because we were doing this as a club in 2010, 2009. This is what our club is doing. This is what the standard just operating procedure of clubs is. So now 12 and a half seasons to one in development wise for the kids in our program from a coming, it's not, it's not our idea, it's just becoming a model association under the USA Hockey Guidelines. This is why we're so passionate, why we had to do this. We couldn't know that our kids were gonna get 12 and a half times the development per season, 125 seasons over the youth hockey career indifference and, and not implement that. So once you know, knowledge is power, once you know the differences, right? We know that, for example, a kid now who stands in our program, six to 16, eight to 18, gets 125 seasons of additional development. Who's, what, who has the better chance of reaching their long-term potential versus a kid that was in our program before we became a model association? And that's why we're so passionate about it. That's what we like to talk about so much. And um, you know, I'm excited to, to have the show today to talk about it. Yeah, and I think some of the key points of moving into your next show is about why activity is important right because i think some people say well they're just out there skating around just not doing anything but they're skating at least so mm -hmm. that's what you count as activity why activity is important and then also why some teams so if we have 125 extra development uh seasons how come some teams are not why don't we win all the games then yeah. right so i think those are two kind of key points that we can dive into next time maybe um about why activity is important and what it even means and then how winning and losing uh, connects with that because as we know that winning and losing it's on if we're if we're doing the long-term athletic development and we're going against competition win at all cost model there's some give and take there right so the win at all cost model may sacrifice the short kids term development, short right? term versus, versus long, -term. long term right and there's some 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 real interesting things about those things too well, so last thing just to leave with the, what, sure. the way we define win right you, you got this from the guys at USA Hockey W I N what's important now, right? What's important now versus, right? Versus, so what are, what, what's our goal? What's our goal at the end of the day with this? I mean, that's how we win. We can win every day if we, if we know what our goals are and we do the right things. We can win every single practice. We can win every single game if we're focusing on the right things. So uh, we'll, maybe we'll continue this on sure. next week and we'll go through the actual application as well. Because sometimes we have a coaches and, and people from other clubs listening to this as well. They might be interested in trying to become a model association. Oh, we got a comment here that I missed but during all the dark and stuff. Oh, you guys are in the dark. Yeah, I know. Thanks. <laughs> you might have tuned in late. We had some uh, technical difficulties today. Hopefully the volume and stuff all came through uh, well for you guys. And we will talk to you Monday at 2 o'clock. 
uh, more on the ABM model association. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. We'll get the lights on. Yeah.